All right, students, let's take some notes on ionic compounds. Please have your notebook ready or your page of notes. Let's go ahead and get started. Remember, this is a video. You can always pause it if you need some time to write things down. You can always watch it over and over again until you really understand the concepts. Here's the essential question. I recommend writing this at the top of your page, preferably in a colored pen so you emphasize it. This is the deep question. How do ionic compounds form? Now, there's not a simple answer to this. It's going to take a little bit to be able to understand it and to do it. So let's get started. Well, let's review what a compound is. We actually learned this from a previous week's worth of stuff where we talked about pure substances. A compound is a pure substance. It's a substance made from two or more different types of elements chemically bonded together. So here's an example of a compound. This is made of this red substance here and four of these white substances. Um, there are two types of compounds that we're going to learn about within the next couple of weeks. The one we're going to talk about this week is ionic compounds. And then in a different week, we'll talk about covalent compounds. So this week is solely about ionic compounds. Before we talk about ionic compounds, I want to talk a little bit about why atoms bond. Well, the reason atoms bond is called the octet rule, and it's an important rule in chemistry. All atoms naturally will gain or lose their valence electrons until their nearest orbit is filled with eight total. This is why it's called the octet rule. So there is a side note. There's obviously exceptions to everything. Hydrogen and helium only need two to fill. If you think about drawing Bohr models, you might realize why and understand that. But here's an example of the octet rule in play. Here's sodium and here's chlorine, two different elements from two different sides of the periodic table. If you think about a lot of the reason of the periodic table and families and electronegativity, you might understand a little bit about how this is going to work. What's the easiest way each of these two elements can form an octet? We'll take a look at sodium and take a look at chlorine. So if we look at chlorine, chlorine's easiest way is to actually gain an electron. And sodium's easiest way is to lose an electron. And the reason for that is is because well, when sodium loses its electron, it goes to a lower shell. And that shell already has eight. So it's a lot easier to lose one outer shell electron to get closer to your lower shells, which is eight. Now, chlorine is had seven before and it gained in the valence electron and now it's eight so it was a lot easier to gain one than to lose seven of them and now chlorine has a different number of electrons so thinking about that what happens what changes about these elements well sodium when it lost an electron, it now has less electrons than protons. If you think about charge, sodium now is a positive one charge. Remember, protons are positively charged. If there's 11 of them, that's 11 positive charge. If electrons are negatively charged and there's only 10 of them, then the total net charge of everything has to be positive one. Now, chlorine, on the other hand, is the opposite. Chlorine gained an electron, so there's one more electron than protons. And so if there's 17 positive protons, and 18 negative electrons, then the charge of chlorine is negative one. This leads us to a very important concept, ions. We learned about ions towards the beginning of the semester this year, but I want to remind you that ions are atoms that have a charge. Now, there's two types of ions. There's anions, which are negatively charged, and these are atoms which gain electrons and become negative. That's what chlorine did in our last example. And there's also cations. Cations are atoms which lose electrons and become positive. That's like our sodium example. So remember that. This is students kind of struggle with this because it's kind of the opposite. When you gain electrons, you become negatively charged because more negative electrons is negative charge. When you lose electrons, you become positively charged because less negative charge means more positive charge. So that might be confusing. Try to remember that. So charges basically are, are based on families. So remember, all families have the same number of valence electrons, like the alkali metals all have one valence electron. So we saw sodium with its one valence electron will lose it. Well, so will lithium, hydrogen, potassium, all these other ones. So I really recommend if you have your periodic table, write these charges in there. All of the alkali metals have a charge of plus one. All of the alkaline earth metals have a charge of plus two. Now, these blue ones right here are kind of weird. These are called the transition metals, and we'll learn about them in a later unit when we get a little bit more complicated. 
types of ionic compounds, but for now, let's just ignore them. There are a few exceptions. Silver has a plus one, cadmium and zinc have a plus two, and then aluminum and gallium have a plus three. Now over here, these are all non-metals. These non-metals right here are minus three. These ones are minus two, minus one, zero. I recommend you write these in your periodic table so we can quickly know what the charges are. And again, this is all based on valence electrons. All right, so what's an ionic compound? We've finally gotten to the point where we can understand what it is. Quite simply, an ionic compound is a compound where two or more atoms are stuck together, and it's a metal atom that becomes positive and a nonmetal atom that becomes negative because the metal atom gives its electrons to the nonmetal. So here's an example of that. Here's sodium and chlorine like we saw before. Sodium has a one valence electron and chlorine has seven valence electrons. So we're just simplifying our picture from before. Sodium gives its valence electron to chlorine. Now what happens when that happens? Well, sodium becomes positive one, chlorine becomes negative one. And this is where that attraction happens. This is why this is an ionic bond or why a compound can form. So they're gonna come together and make a new compound. This is called sodium chloride. This is table salt, by the way. And the total charge now is zero because each of those charges cancel out. But what if we get two elements where their charges don't match, like lithium, which is a positive one, and nitrogen, which is a minus three? Here, I want to show you these in, ter in terms of puzzle pieces. So if you did that simulation activity, this will hopefully make sense because you've done many of these similar. Well, in order to do this, we need to understand the rule of zero charge. Elements or ionic compounds must come together where their atoms have enough of each until their overall charge attracts to zero. If that doesn't make sense, let me show you an example. Let's go back to our example of lithium and nitrogen. Notice lithium is a positive one and nitrogen is a minus three. There's just not enough lithium to counteract the nitrogen. So we're going to go ahead and add two more lithiums or a total of three lithiums in order to, to get these to cancel each other out. So three lithiums and one nitrogen can come together. Now we have an ionic compound that everything cancels. This is the rule of zero charge in action. In other words, three positive ones and one minus three is equal to zero. And now we have a compound. This is Li3n. Now, how do we name this compound? Well, ionic compounds follow the general rule. We always put the metal first and we just name it. Then we do the nonmetal second and we end, change the ending of the nonmetal to ide. So in our last example, Li3N, we call that lithium nitride. For sodium and chlorine, it's sodium chloride. All right, here's a student example. See if you can figure this one out yourself. Pause the video and see if you can figure out how magnesium and chlorine go together. Did you pause the video? All right, let's see if we can work this and see, figure out what the formula is. All right, magnesium on our periodic table has a positive two and chlorine has a minus one charge. You can see right away, these aren't gonna go together. But if we had two chlorines, that counteracts the one magnesium. And so we have MgCl2. Well, what does this look like with the, with the electron dots, the valence dots? Well, here's magnesium. It has two valence electrons, and each of the chlorines have seven valence electrons. Magnesium will get rid of its two electrons to each of the chlorines. This is why it becomes positive two charge and why each of the chlorines become minus one charge. Now, when they come together, magnesium and chlorine put together as MgCl2, and the name of that is magnesium chloride. All right, that leads us to the end of our notes. Take a moment to review the notes. Go back and highlight the key terms and the important concepts. If you need to, ponder and ask questions and go back to the discussion and ask another question or answer some other students' questions. Finally, summarize this page by answering the essential question. Take some time in detail. Write a detailed summary paragraph answering the essential question. All right, good luck, everyone.